So welcome to Wednesday, which is Aurora Day. Uh, today is going to be structured again. I'm, um, each day has been a little bit different, and today again will be structured a little bit differently from the previous two days. Um, and I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, you heard me, but not everybody did, um, that uh, as I was preparing last night and running through the content that I, I was hoping to present today, um, I, I kind of realized that uh, I was running through the... what. A large part of the content is I want to go through, um, we have a whole bunch of content which is a, just sort of that we've already put together that's a deep dive into Aurora Postgres. It's really good content and um, it's been a while since I've looked closely at it and when I was looking last night I was kind of thinking this is a lot for me to catch up on and so what I decided is that, is that when I get to that part rather than me running through the slides and trying to sort of remember exactly what each slide was about, um, what I'm, what I'm going to do is as I'm going to play the video of Grant McAllister presenting that from reInvent last summer, um, because basically there's only about two slides that have content that's changed. So I'm gonna run through his presentation, take down any questions just like you've been doing all week. Um, you can put them in the chat room and then we'll circle back to them at the end. And uh, after the presentation finishes, I'll come back and just sort of add on, uh, mention the one thing that's different. And then after that, so I'll do, I'm going to talk a quick little bit at the beginning, we'll do the video, um, and then I'm going to actually get on the whiteboard for a little while and explain a couple of, I think, really important concepts in Aurora that I haven't had time to get onto slides yet. Um, but they're things that a lot of people were asking about um, and asking for me to cover, and they're just questions that we get a lot. Okay, so diving into Aurora Postgres. In order to set the stage for Aurora, first, um, uh, let's take sort of step back and take a look at, at sort of the, um, the, the bigger picture here, uh, thinking about sort of RDS. Um, in RDS, first of all, you have RDS Postgres, which has, right, is basically a database running with EBS storage underneath it. Um, then you've got Aurora Postgres, which has the Aurora storage underneath it. And these are very different things, right? EBS is very different from Aurora storage. But one, um, one really important kind of point is that from your client's perspective, um, they look very similar. And actually, Grant's going to touch on this in his talk too, right? Uh, there are a lot of um, shared, um, there are a lot of shared components too. So in addition to the fact that, so to your client, like if you design an application to work on Postgres, whether it's open source Postgres, whether it's RDS Postgres, that application will continue to work the same on Aurora Postgres. That's part of the way that we've built it. Um, in addition to that client level compatibility, there's another thing, which is that there actually are a lot of shared components in the orchestration part as well. So like the infrastructure that automates and manages a lot of these things. And that's also part of the reason that it's, um, that, that it's, that we're able to do this so easily. Like for example, things like IAM authentication, um, things like S3 integration, which isn't on the list here. Uh, because there's a lot of similar, there's a lot of this really the same moving parts behind the scenes that are, are involved in managing both of these. Um, so, because of that, I, I'm actually going to, just before I, we dive into the Aurora stuff, I just want to mention two or three things on the RDS Postgres side, um, because you'll see that they kind of relate to each other. So, First, just talking about backups. And, and this is also important because on the happiness hint slide that I have every day, I have, to, I have a couple points about backups. One of the things that we're always telling people is like, please, if this is a production system, just set, do the maximum backup window, um, which is 35 days in RDS. That's the same window, whether you're on Aurora or an RDS. Backups work differently between the two. Um, on RDS, it's basically using EBS snapshots, right? Um, and then because uh, you're sitting on top of EBS volumes, and then the uh, wall logs themselves are being archived off separately, and they're being, they're being copied off on a continual basis. Uh, and then recovery involves taking that snapshot image and replaying the logs back on top of it. Um, yeah, and, and the reason, well, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about some of the different ways um, that things can break or things can go wrong, and then what you do about that. Um, but it's, it's really, um, it turns out to be really useful just to have 30, a whole 35 days worth of backups. I mean, not the least of which is that sometimes you don't even discover that things have gone wrong until a little while later, right? 
I mean, if somebody had gone in and like changed some data in one of your tables, for example, you might not catch it, you might not realize it until like a week or so afterwards. Um, th there's a lot of different reasons that that's important. From an availability perspective, um, we haven't talked about this a ton yet, um, but on, on the happiness hint slide too, like you'll see on there, you use multi-AZ. Um, this is going to be especially relevant tomorrow. I, I, I do need to just quickly introduce multi-AZ on RDS for people that aren't familiar with it. I'm, I mean, you guys already are, um, but there is, there is going to be a, a very broad audience for the class, and I kind of want to make sure that everybody gets introduced to it. So in RDS Postgres, uh, actually in, in RDS with all of the, uh, the non-Aurora engines, um, it's except for SQL Server. That one uses um, always a different technology. But all the rest of the engines, right, we're talking storage level replication. So it's, 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 underneath the it's underneath the way that MAS works specifically is that the database talks to the storage. And then at the storage tier, the storage manages rep maintaining a second copy in a different AZ. And then what happens is your application is pointed at the primary your application and both of your availability zones are pointed at the primary database. And your database is c physically maintaining a copy of that. And then if something goes wrong and your primary database has a problem, uh, then what happens is we stop that replication. We switch the primary over to the second availability zone. That's managed by the control plane software. Um, there's a DNS server. And then what happens is the, the database signals the DNS to switch what it's pointing to. Once the DNS has changed and your clients pick up that, the clients reconnect to a different IP address and they're able to reconnect to the primary. And this all works. This all works. We've been doing this for a long time. It works well. Um, this is, this is multi-AZ on RDS. Now, Aurora is, of course, going to work different, but it's important to know what you're comparing against, I think, to, set, to sort of set the stage for Aurora. At that point in time, we're, of course, free to replace the secondary as well, so we can, um, the, the secondary database can be replaced, and then synchronization is, this is all done automatically under the covers, right, by RDS. Um, so that's, that's MAS. Aurora is going to be different. Um, there are some things, though, again, that are going to be common. Uh, it is a, a well-established um, best practice, well-architected principle in AWS to be multi-AZ, right? When you architect applications, this is just something that you'll hear us saying all the time. When you architect applications to always architect um, over AZs, um, and, and you want to architect so that for your production systems, if there, if there were some sort of an issue that one AZ was unavailable, your application would continue to operate with the other AZs. That's, that's a, just an important principle in general, right? Um, one more thing to talk about is the idea of read replicas. This is especially important. And the reason this is important, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come around to that. Starting with RDS. So a read replica, so this is showing a mass cluster down here on the bottom, right? Uh, we've got our primary and our secondary. These are across two different AZs. And what a read replica is, um, is that we then maintain another copy that is somewhere else um, asynchronously. Whereas, so uh, what synchronously means, I, um, you guys know the terminology, right? Synchronously means that like when I, I, have a com I have a transaction, when I say commit, that commit operation is not acknowledged back to your application until it has been committed in both AZs. Like the data's on the disk in both AZs. And then, you, and then your application receives an acknowledgement that your data is durable, that it's safe. Uh, that's, that's what synchronous means. Asynchronous means that, the, that you, your, your message will go back to your application right away. And then in the background, it'll continue to be synchronized across. Um, but it's, you're not going to be blocked waiting for it. That's asynchronous. Um, there's a couple of different use cases. Oh, uh, and the one other thing that I think is important to point out about this that people miss a lot of times uh, is that um, in Postgres, uh, I, I'll just start with Postgres because that's what we're here to talk about. In RDS Postgres, these, read are, these are physical replicas, meaning that if you were to open up the data files on a read replica in Postgres, the data file bit for bit would look pretty much the same as your primary database. That is not true of, my, of RDS MySQL. 
right? So it depends. So that differs from one engine to another inside of RDS. Um, RDS MySQL, they're logical, meaning that like if you open the file, the bits would not be the same. Now, if you select from the table, you'll see the same data. But if you open the file, it's not the same bits. Um, that said, both in the case of MAS and in the case of replicas, it's also the other kind of architectural thing that's important to understand is that it's, it, each of these has their own copy of the data. So we're maintaining a full copy of the data. We have to, the primary has to send messages to the replica that can tell, and then the replica has to do I.O. after receiving those messages. You're going to see that that's a really key difference for Aurora. The, um, there, there's kind of like two or three use cases. Um, I'll just kind of skip over these because I pulled these slides from somewhere else. And uh, uh, this was kind of talking more about why you would use read replicas, the availability case where you can maintain it like that. Upgrades are another reason. Um, your read replicas stay up while the upgrade's happening. Um, modifications on replicas. So you see that like one of the use cases that people have for replicas um, is just increased availability. Uh, the second one is latency. You can do replicas across regions with Postgres as well. Um, it is still one click. There is um, one more thing I want to mention real quickly about this. Um, do you remember on the very first day we talked about like hot updates? We talked about kind of the overview on architecture. And one of the really important things that we talked about was like how you have those old row versions that have to get cleaned up, right? And that this is what vacuum does. That vacuum is going to come in. But remember, one of the other things we talked about was your longest running transaction and how that, you know, Postgres is always keeping track of what's just the oldest connection, what's the oldest transaction in the system, because anything that's outside of that range that's older than that is, is it's, it's eligible to be cleaned up. It's safe. So if I have a version of the row from yesterday, but the oldest transaction started an hour ago, well, that data from yesterday that was deleted yesterday, I don't need it. At this point, it's safe to truly delete it. Um, but if, a if there's some data that was deleted 15 minutes ago, and there's a report that started running an hour ago and it hasn't finished yet, I need to keep that, even though that data has been deleted, I have to keep it around until the report's done, right? Because the report needs to see a consistent picture of the database. So that's really important. And what happens if that report that I'm talking about, that I kicked off an hour ago, what if it's running on a read replica? This is actually a really important question. Because if it's running on a read replica, then how is Vacuum supposed to know that it can't delete that record? Well, the answer to that question actually is completely different between cross-region and non-cross-region. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Um, let me go back a slide. And th this is, it's, it's kind of, it actually may not always be this way. I'm pretty sure it is. I have to, I, sh I should probably double check the defaults. Is this, does this sounding right to you? Yeah. Okay. It's yep. It is different physical and logical. That was what I was thinking. Yeah. Because we built physical first. No, no, no. It's not physical logical. Cross region is still yeah. physical. Yeah, but lots. I mean the slots. The slots, Sorry, yes. The slots. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yep. Yeah. The reason was that we built the, um, it, it was actually just literally the order that we built things. <laughs> um, when we, we built the cross-region stuff later, and when we built the cross-region stuff, at, by that point in time, Postgres had a really fantastic new capability that po the Postgres community actually enhanced the database so that a master database could actually keep track of the oldest transaction on a replica. And that way, Vacuum could actually know. That didn't used to exist. <laughs> Um, back when we when we built the in-region replication feature, um, it was before they had done that, and um, we haven't. We still support those old versions of Postgres for in-region replication, um, and at the, and so the way that it works is within. Now this is configurable. You can you can configure all of this so you could configure it yourself in region in a parameter group. But the default settings are that if you're in region, you, you could have a report running. And what will happen is your report's running, um, and Vacuum will clean it up. And then what's going to happen is the Vacuum will send those messages to the read replica saying, OK, now you clean up your records. The read replica, at least it is smart enough to know when it tries to clean, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I've got an open transaction. So what will actually happen in that case is that your read replica will just pause. 
it'll stop. And it's just going to wait for the report to finish. But what that means is that it can't do anything, it can't replay any more data from the master. So your replica is slowly going to fall behind until the report finishes. When the report finishes, then it'll catch up. And this is something we see all the time in the Postgres fleet, by the way. Um, we, we have alarming um, <laughs> because we want to watch for replication getting broken, and we need to know if, if something is wrong with our, our control plan or orchestration software. Um, and then also there are CloudWatch metrics on this, so it's, it's fairly easy to observe. Uh, and yeah, we see, we see replicas that lag be because of that. So when we built cross-region, on the other hand, um, see this is in US East 1, and then here in this picture there's one in EU West 1. Uh, cross-region was able to use replication slots, uh, exactly what you mentioned a moment ago there. Um, and what replication slots, or another, another, th another name for the, the key feature is called hot standby feedback. Hot standby feedback is the name of the parameter that you need to change in order for Postgres to use something called replication slots. And hot standby feedback means that this is called a hot standby database. It's, a, it's hot because it's open for queries. That's what makes it a hot standby. And then it, uh, it will send feedback to the master, which tells Vacuum, oh, hey, there's a transaction running. So Vacuum then is smart enough to like just keep going, and, but just leave those rows out there. And then the replica will never fall behind. Um, this will also become important as we start talking about Aurora. So cross-region, they're talking about reasons you would do that, latency going down, um, doing DRs and DR moves, things like that. So kind of illustrating somebody moving across. You can promote replicas to become uh, new primaries, which is kind of cool. One last thing that I'm going to take from the RDS Postgres deck before we dive into Aurora, because this works the same on Aurora, um, but it's not in the Aurora deck and it's not talked about there, uh, and it's really important, is upgrades. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about this at the, um, toward the end of this particular session. Um, but so Postgres, uh, did I, I might have mentioned this yesterday or the day before too, but Postgres has... Uh, the, post, the way the community organizes their releases is that they have what, what they call major versions and then what they call minor versions. The minors, I, I actually prefer to call them quarterly updates because that's what they are. Uh, so they don't put new features, they're not going and building. That what, what they're doing is just they have a schedule and four times a year on a certain date they just take the critical bug fixes, like stuff that had to be backported, and then the security vulnerabilities. So any, any, any security issues that happen um, are bundled together, and then those are, they ship basically an update to the old major. And if you read the language, they're very clear that like they are only putting, the stuff that they're putting in those, those maintenance updates are things where they believe it would be more risky for you to not upgrade and that it's less risky for you to just get that patched code into your system. So the, the consistent recommendation with Postgres is to, is to stay very much on top of installing those quarterly updates. It's very similar like in the Oracle world to SPUs or PSUs, um, that kind of, that, that's how I mentally think of it. The other important thing to understand about uh, majors and minors in Postgres lingo is that, so a minor version upgrade um, never, there's no upgrade script. There's, you never run a script. So it, it never involves changes to the data. Um, it's, it is purely a binary swap out, and that's it. So what that means, first of all, is that minor versions are, are, are not going to take a long time, right? A minor upgrade is always going to, it's just the time to restart the database. That's basically it. Um, this slide isn't even quite right because we don't shut down the instance and start the instance uh, when we do a minor upgrade. Um, I'm not, I have to tell them about that. Uh, in RDS, it's, uh, um, and with Aurora both, um, a minor upgrade is, is literally, we'll provision the software out ahead of time and then it's just like shut down the old, start up the new. And that's all the time, that's the only actual outage that you have to deal with. And then once it's back up, we can clean out the old software and free the disk space back up. 
on the binary volume. Major version upgrades are very different. A major version upgrade always involves running a utility. Well, in RDS, we run a utility called PG upgrade. The other way you could do a major upgrade is with like a dump and load or something like that, which you could also do in RDS. You could provision a new instance and replicate it or dump and load. Um, when you click the button that says upgrade, or actually what you're doing is you're going to a drop down and choosing a version and saying save. You do a modify. Um, what RDS Postgres is doing under the covers is using a utility called PG upgrade. Um, PG upgrade does not have to uh, scan your data files and to date, so far, um, there has never been a version of Postgres that we've shipped on RDS where upgrade had to like go in and change the block format of the data. That would be very, very expensive. However, what it does do, the way that PG upgrade works is that the data stays in place, the data doesn't need to be moved, it's using actually hard links to um, to just create new file entries that point to the same files. But the metadata, there's all the, the data dictionary stuff. So the, all those catalog stuff like the PG class view we looked at in the hands-on lab yesterday. What Postgres, what PG upgrade actually does um, is it basically does a dump and load of the metadata. It's similar to like what transportable table spaces would do in Oracle. Um, what that means and why that's important is that the time to run a PG upgrade is very much impacted by the number of objects in your schema, in your database. So uh, the place where we have seen customers run into issues is, is like customers that have hundreds of thousands or even like millions of objects in their database. Um, that, that can start to take a while. So a major version upgrade, um, I mean, you should test your miners too but you need to probably have a, a greater level of rigor in the way that you test a major version upgrade. And you're not just touching, testing new functionality and features. You're also testing just like the timing of it, right? Um, so you want to, you know, make a copy of your database, make sure that copy is completely initialized or hydrated. Um, and then you want to run the upgrade on that copy and see how long it takes. It's an important thing to do. I mentioned also that you could use replication uh, as well, which is another strategy for a way to do upgrades. This is uh, using DMS, um, and that's it. All right. So at this point, I'm going to sort of pause, and this is where I'm going to sort of stop, and I'm going to put the video up um, of Grant. Now, while the video is playing, um, uh, are you in the chime room, by the way? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. I was going to say, we, we're, we've been, I, I want to use that chime room as, uh, the great thing about putting questions in there is that other people see it as well. Um, and, I mean, there's been, there's been, there has been, like, sometimes other people just been able to answer the question. But the, the bigger thing that I'm hoping for is it just sort of stimulates thinking. Um, and that, you know, like you might ask a question that makes somebody else like, oh, you know, I saw something similar to that just last week on my database and I have a question about this. Um, so the, I see a lot of value to getting the questions punched out if you're able to. Um, it's about a 50 minute video. Good evening, everyone. I think it's evening. It's always hard to tell in Vegas. <laughs> Put you in a nice dark room, no windows. My name is Grant McAllister. I'm a senior principal engineer, work for AWS, as you might have guessed from the logo. Um, I work on RDS, and most of the time I spend with the Postgres engines. Today what we're going to do is we're going to dive into Aurora Postgres. Uh, we're going to look at the changes we've made, why we made them, and why you might care about those. We'll also talk about the things we've delivered in the last year for Aurora Postgres, and how you migrate to it. So one of the first things I wanted to talk about was RDS in general. There's a lot of confusion that Aurora is not part of RDS, and it actually is. It just has separate branding. Marketing folks wanted to brand it separately. But it's run under the same management platform that all seven of our engines. Our two Aurora engines, our two commercial engines, and our three other open source engines. So all these capabilities that you get from a managed RDS system are true with Aurora as well. But because it's our engine, we've made some other changes, right? So from an RDS perspective, we actually have two flavors of Postgres. We have RDS Postgres, which is community Postgres, with just a few small changes for security, and it runs on EC2, runs on an EBS volume, right? So this is pretty much standard the same way you would do it if you were just running an EC2. On the other side, what we have is Aurora Postgres, and this is quite a bit different because of the storage. 
So we have Aurora storage. And so this is database aware storage. So that's fundamentally different than a block store. And I'll get into what those changes mean for you running your application. But the cool thing from your perspective, if you have a client and you want to connect to either one of these, it's going to work exactly the same. They talk the same protocol. You've, whether you're connecting with PSQL, ODBC, JDBC, whatever, it's going to look exactly the same. Same objects, same commands. And just to run through like in more detail, you can see that we support Postgres 9, 6, and 10 for both of these engines. Um, we have the same extensions on both of them. We have the same backup recovery and PITR capabilities. We have a high availability and durability story for both these engines. We, they're both secure by default. And actually, this is one of the cool new features that we've just released, which is our IAM, or Identity and Access Management, ability to use those credentials to log into your database so you don't have to have passwords anymore. So that's a really nice feature on both of these engines. They both support read replicas. They both support cross-region snapshots and scale compute and online scale storage. Now, the storage on the RDS one is up to 32 terabytes, 64 terabytes on Aurora. There's two features that we're still working on to get to parity. One of them is cross-region replication, and the other is outbound logical. And I'll talk more about those in the presentation. I want to highlight that right now, the max version that we support is version 10 uh, for both these engines. But for RDS Postgres, we have a preview region where we have version 11 and 11.0 in it. And we're rapidly working on getting 11 for Aurora as well. So that's coming. So let's start with one of the fundamental differences. This is log-based storage. And so because of that, there's a lot of fundamentals that change with how Aurora works. So the first one is that we have no log buffer. And to explain that, I'm going to walk through what happens on Postgres and Aurora Postgres. So the queued work there in the red, those eight blocks, you can think of them as eight commits, for example, that have happened on different sessions. So they're already, everybody hits commit at once. Modern databases have this really nice feature, group commits, so they can all go into the log buffer at the same time. But one of the problems with a log buffer is once it's getting ready to flush, nothing else can go into it, right? So if more queued work comes in, it's got to wait until that log buffer gets flushed down to storage and acknowledged, right? And then the queued work can go. So you can see how this is a single point of bottlenecking, right? Now, on Aurora, it's quite different. When the transactions come in, they just flow down to the storage as they're happening, right? And so it's an ordered system, and you want it to be durable, so we actually have to keep track of these things. So we have what I like to call durability tracking. So we use a 406 quorum in Aurora, so it means we need four acknowledgments from our storage system to say we're good, right? So we keep track of these, and I'm illustrating that, where you know, after a tiny little bit of time, we've got a couple of them in two places, some of them in zero, some of them in one, and then finally we get A to four, right? So then you would acknowledge the commit back to the client. But you'll notice that C is also at four. Well, we're good, right? We should be able to mark that one durable. But this is an ordered database, right? And because B happened before C, we need it to get to four durability as well before we can actually mark C as durable. So, you know, and you can see the same thing is happening with E there where we have to wait for D to get committed. So the other thing with Aurora is we write a lot less. Let's walk through the differences. So on Postgres, if you have a tuple, you know, just a row in your heap block, that's what I'm showing, that block in memory, and you go do an update. Well, an update in Postgres is essentially a delete and insert, right? So you end up touching both of those tuples. And those are going to get logged to the wall, right? So this is for crash durability. But you'll notice something else showed up there, right? A full block. Why did I get a full copy of the block in the log? Well, this is for another form of uh, crash recovery. And I'll talk about why we do that. Now, we only do that the first time you touch the block after a checkpoint. So if I go and do another thing, like update the tuple again or insert a new row, um, that's just going to get just the, the log vector is going to go into the storage, right? So this is all normal Postgres. At some point, you want a checkpoint, right? You want to make that block durable on disk, right? So you don't need the recovery log anymore. And the wall has to be archived. And that archive has to be copied to S3 so it's backed up. And then we take snapshots of the data file, right? But when you do a checkpoint, it's actually not just a single write, right? In Postgres, the default block size is 8K. But for example, Linux, which is what we run on, is 4K IOs. So if you're in the middle of doing that checkpoint, and guess what? The system crashes, you might have only got half of that write to disk. Guess what would happen? Some point later, you'd find out you have a corrupt block, right? So Postgres handles this by taking that full block and during crash recovery, using it to repair this split block, right? This works great. It's been used for a long time, but it involves a lot of writing. 
On the Aurora side, it's quite different. We have no checkpointing, no full page rights. So when we do the update, we get the same thing happening, the two tuples changed, we eject those log vectors to storage, and that's it, right? If we do another one, same thing. So there's no full blocks, there's no checkpointing, there's no writing of data blocks, right? We only write log vectors. So we back this up continuously from Aurora Storage to S3, so that's how we get you point in time durability for recovery. And again, no checkpoints, no full page rights. So you're saying, well, how does this all magically happen? Well, we have this really intelligent storage layer, right? And this is comprised of a lot of different storage servers in the back end, and I'm just illustrating one of them here. So if you have a read-write node and it does an update, that log vector is gonna flow into the incoming queue. And this is an in-memory queue. Once it's there, it then gets processed into the update queue, which is basically the durable form on disk. Once that's done, we can actually acknowledge back to the client, you know, one of the, one of the nodes is acknowledged, right? So the interesting thing here is this is the only synchronous thing that happens. All the other things I'm gonna show you are background pieces, right? So at this point, that vector will go into the hot log, which can be used for peer-to-peer -peer gossips, and we also do coalescing of the block, right? So we read blocks, so we actually have to apply the log vectors. So you can think of this happening on a block-by-block -block basis that we're essentially doing recovery continuously, right? So as I said, the peer-to-peer -peer storage, we do repair via these logs, and then we also push both the log vectors and the blocks out to S3 so that you can have point in time to any point you want within 35 days. So again, when you read, you don't read log vectors, you gotta read a block, right? That's how Postgres works. So if the block has been coalesced, then that's what you read. If it hasn't, then we do an on-the-fly coalesce and coalesce whatever log changes we need to make a block, right? So you never have a long crash recovery with Aurora because we're doing this continuously. To kind of show what this looks like in practice, I created a little test. I do an insert test. I built a table with nine columns. They're all different kinds. Some are random, some are right-leaning, different object types. And then I indexed every column. Now that's not normal, right? But it is normal to have a lot of indexes on a big table. I mean, I've had tables, I've seen tables that have 75 indexes on two or 300 columns, right? So this isn't really unusual. So when we go run that insert workload, vertical axis is uh, inserts per second, and so, you know, bigger is better, right? The blue line is sort of regular Postgres, right? And we see that we get like 25,000 writes per or inserts per second right off the bat. It's pretty good, right? But it drops really quickly. And the reason for that is, as the database gets larger, as you've inserted more data, you have more blocks, right? And your indexes get larger. So the chance that you're touching a block between checkpoints gets higher, and so that full page rights increase and increase and increase as your database gets larger. So your performance basically slowly goes down. So if you're a DBA, you say, well, I can fix that. I can make my checkpoints longer, right? I'll just increase the max wall segments. And so that's what I did in the purple line, right? And you can see that helped for about 20 minutes. But then the database got large enough that again we started getting full page rights and we see this degradation of performance, right? What you'll notice on the yellow line there is that this is Aurora. We don't have checkpoints, we don't have full page rights, so we have very stable performance even as the database grows and grows, right? So not only do we have stable performance, but we have better performance, right? And this is the same if we do updates. I did the same tests, same tables, updated two columns, and you can see we're getting about three times the performance with Aurora that we were with uh, even tuned Postgres. And again, this is because we don't have a log buffer, we don't have that single point of contention, we don't have full page rights. So the other critical thing about writing more is that you don't necessarily want to take a long time to crash recover, which is very typical for most databases. To illustrate this, I have a chart where the vertical axis is recovery time, you'd like that to be low, and then the horizontal axis is writes per second, you'd want that to be high, so you want that to be far down the range. So when we start pushing Postgres, what we see is that as we start, we got like three gig of redo generated on the first arrow, right? We're doing about 18,000 TPS. It's not bad, but as I add more clients to push the database harder, guess what? My recovery time goes up by quite a bit to 50 seconds, and I've only doubled my throughput. So if I keep pushing the database, what you see up here, we're generating 30 gig of redo between checkpoints, and my recovery time is taking over two minutes, right? So this is a dramatic increase. And so this has always been one of the trade-offs with most relational databases is you had to make. You had to say, would I like to be able to write really fast or would I like to have low crash recovery? So can you guys see that little dot out to the far right? 
it's really hard to see, so I circled it for you. That's Aurora. So Aurora, as I was saying with the storage, it does continuous recovery, right? So we don't actually have to do crash recovery. So it takes three seconds for Aurora to come back up in this case. But you'll also see we're doing dramatically more writes, like 3x, right, um, compared to Postgres, even at the largest scale. So this is one of the nice things with Aurora. You don't actually have to make this trade off of, of these two different uh, capabilities. So let's talk more about the base architecture of Aurora Postgres. So I'm demonstrating, or I'm showing here three availability zones. That's very typical for our uh, regions. And the blue block is essentially Aurora storage. And you want to think of it sort of virtually, right? It's across all the availability zones. The little blue ones inside of those are individual storage servers. Now, I'm just showing six in each one, but usually there's hundreds or thousands, right? When you go and provision an application and you say, I want a database, Aurora Postgres, what's going to happen is we're going to go take 10 gig chunk segments and put them on these storage servers, right? And that's what I'm illustrating with the six different colors, because we get six copies, right? So you can have, you can connect applications from multiple AZs. That's always a good idea for availability. When we do writes, again, we write log records, right? So they're going to get written to all six places. We only need four of them to get a commit done. But you'll see that the, all the different colors are involved, right? When we read, we read blocks back. And typically, we're going to read from the local AZ because it's going to be fastest. But we actually do that on a periodic basis to see which one's going to be faster. So we don't have to do a quorum read or anything you know, crazy like that that's going to take a long time. So sometimes you actually have problems with getting quorum, right? Sometimes two of those writes may not show up. So what do we do then? Well, we can actually do repair, as I said, peer-to-peer -peer gossip between the different nodes. And they'll actually send the missing log records to the other node, right? In the case of a failure of a whole node, we'll actually make a copy of that segment onto a different node, right? We'll also do this for hotspot management. So if you're pushing hard, we'll actually move things around so that there's enough resources on that node, stuff you don't actually have to worry about. So the other thing that's really cool about Aurora is that there's read-only nodes. And the difference between sort of regular Postgres is when you make a read-only node, you have to copy the data. But here you don't because the storage is shared, right? It's what I call clustered storage, right? So as soon as you fire it up, you can read the data out of that storage. You don't have to make a copy. Now, you'll notice that little uh, sort of purple line going between the read-write node and the read-only node. We do communicate. We do send information from the read-write node to the read-only node. But we only do it to invalidate things in cache. We don't actually have to send it over so it can be written. And you can have more than one read-only node. In fact, you can have up to 15. You can have a lot, right? And so you can have different applications using different read-only nodes for different purposes. Now, the big thing about having multiple nodes is that in the case of a failure, what's really nice is the good thing is your data is durable no matter what, right? So you don't actually have to worry about data durability for having extra nodes. But if you want a fast failover, you want to have a node. So what we're going to do is we're going to promote one of your read-only nodes to a read-write node, and it's going to start being able to write. So this, this happens in typically about 30, 35 seconds, with uh, including the DNS propagation. And you can actually connect to all the nodes so you don't actually have to wait for DNS propagation. So let's talk a little bit about why we picked 406 Quorum. So when we started RDS back like almost 10 years ago, we, we knew that we probably wanted to do some form of durability, but when we first released it, it was basically just a single AZ product, right? So when you would do a commit, you're basically going to write to EBS and get a response back. But it's actually a little more complicated than that, because EBS behind the scenes actually has two machines, right? It's mirroring your data. So when you're writing, you're actually writing to the first machine, then you're writing to the, it's writing to the second machine, getting acknowledgment back and all the way back to your server, right? And at that point, you're good, you're committed. But guess what? This only works if you don't have a problem in that AZ, right? So this is where you want to have a multi-AZ solution that actually replicates the data synchronously. So we actually looked at having one or two different, you know, two or three copies. So first we said, well, okay, let's look at just having a secondary or maybe having a tertiary. So we actually played with having, you know, th multiple copies. So just to illustrate what happens when you have three locations, you basically do that commit and you send out writes. And the red writes are the remote ones. So the, the black ones are local. So the red ones are going to be slower, and in some cases, your AZs are farther apart, right? So the writes take longer to happen. So as we're progressing, you'll see that the local copy is actually moving along quite well, and the remote ones are just getting started, right? So at this point, you've got basically two of them done, right? But you have to wait for the third one if it's synchronous replication. So we've got to wait for a couple more, you know, maybe milliseconds for this to finally finish. 
Now, the other thing with this kind of replication is the more copies you have, the more chance you can have for one of them not to respond, right? So if this last write doesn't actually come back, you never get that acknowledgement, at some point you time it out, right? And at that point, you actually have to fence the system to figure out who's the live nodes. And so you'd be like, oh, well, the primary and secondary are still live. We'll leave them in the, you know, sort of group, and we'll kick out the tertiary. When the tertiary comes back, it actually has to catch up all the stuff that was missing, right? It's not just one write that you skip. It's all of them, right? And this is quite different on Aurora. So we did a bunch of testing, and these are numbers from quite a while ago. EBS has gotten quite a bit faster, and network latency has gotten better. But this is just to illustrate sort of the difference when you have two nodes and four copies, or three nodes and six copies. So the blue is the two nodes. The green is the three. So latency on the vertical axis, you'd like it to be lower. So the 50th percentile writes, you can see that really there's not a lot of difference. It's six to seven milliseconds, right? You're like, hey, that doesn't seem expensive. I'd love this. Give me three copies, right? But the problem occurs when you start looking at like the four nines percentile. Like this is only one in 10,000 IOs, but the difference is basically four X on going to the third copy. And that's because you have more jitter in a system when you have more copies, right? So we looked at this and in the end we said, now nah, we're just gonna do two way multi AZ for standard RDS. But when it came to Aurora, we thought we can do better because we have a different storage system. So what you'll notice here is I have my three availability zones again. And I have my primary, but you'll notice I don't have a tertiary or you know, secondary node, because I don't need those, right? My, my storage is my durability. So when I do a commit on Aurora, essentially we're gonna send out six simultaneous write requests. And they're gonna go out to all the storage nodes, and then they're gonna start getting responses back. And as soon as we get the first four back, you'll notice we're able to commit. So if these other two never show up, that's okay, because we'll do peer-to-peer -peer replication to, to catch up. But if they just miss one write, we don't stop writing to that node, right? We'll just be behind that one little transaction and it'll get fixed by one of the other replicas, right? Or storage nodes, to be clear. So this is quite good that we don't actually have this really coarse model, right? It's a very granular system of repair. So what does this result in? This results in much better latency. So this is Sysbench, the P95 response time, right? This is 1,000 clients, so this is a high-skill workload, and we got a 30-gig uh, working set. So the blue line is RDS, Postgres, single AZ, no backups. The yellow line is Aurora. And what you can see is that Aurora is very consistent, right? Over time, it's very good. It doesn't have a lot of variability. Now, the blue is all over the place. Can anyone guess what that, these blue kind of sections are, where it goes up and down like that? That's checkpoints, exactly correct, right? So what's happening here on regular Postgres is the checkpoints are basically fighting for the IOs with that log buffer being flushed, right? So at the bottom of the graph, it's pretty good. That's when it's not checkpointing, and the, you know, it's pretty good. But you'll also notice this is single AZ. We're not actually durable here across multiple AZs. This is actually not even a really a good fair comparison, because if you made this multi-AZ, the blue line would be even higher, right? So let's talk a little bit more about what we do for replication and a cool feature called clones. So in Postgres, RDS Postgres, if you ask for a replica, we're gonna basically take a snapshot of the EBS volume, we're gonna restore that EBS volume, then we're gonna fire up a read-only uh, EC2 instance on it, and great, but you still have to catch up from that all happening, right, and that takes a bit of time. On a really high write workload, this could take an hour or two for it to catch up. Once it's all caught up, if you do an update, essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna write to EBS and you're gonna get that response back. So that's all good. And at the same time, you're sending an asynchronous request across to the read-only node. Now, it might actually have to read that block into memory before it can write it out again. So that's a lot of work that has to happen. On Aurora, this is quite different. We have just Aurora storage. So when you want a read-only node, Bam, we just pop one up. It takes a couple minutes, right? Because it's just firing up an EC2 instance and attaching it to the storage. When you do an update on Aurora, that same thing has to happen. We write to storage, right? And we have the asynchronous replication going across, but it's just doing it for anything in memory. So it's only updating the blocks in memory. And it doesn't have to write on the other side because the data's in the storage, right? It's shared. So I wanted to show this, and I thought, well, I'll use pgbench, and it has a read-write mode and a read-only mode. So I was gonna run the read-write node with the read, or the write workload, and on the read-only node, I'll read, read from it. So 
there's four tables. They all get modified on the read-write workload. On the select-only workload, it's only the accounts table that gets read. So you start off Postgres, it looks like this, but then as soon as you start doing asynchronous requests, guess what? That node actually has to load those other tables into memory because it's gotta be able to apply the changes to those tables as they happen. In Aurora, this is quite different in that we're only doing the stuff in memory. So the accounts table is the only one that ever gets touched because it's being read by the, the select-only benchmark. So this is actually really important for what happens about replication lag. To illustrate that, I took a replica. I'm running 8,000 TPS writes on the primary. And on the read-only node, I'm doing 200,000 read-only requests, right? So that's pretty impressive. And this is stock Postgres, right? RDS Postgres. This is the CloudWatch metrics from the replica. And you'll notice sort of the, the thin orange line is the writes that are happening. So it's going along quite well. And then where the big arrow is, I did a really not nice thing to my database. I backfilled the whole PG Bench history table. I updated every row, right, in one transaction. So that's not something you'd like to see, but guess what? It happens in production where people need to do backfills, right? What you'll notice is the green line. So the green line is the replication delay in seconds. And so the reason people ask me, why is it in seconds? Well, when we first started RDS, it was MySQL. MySQL had kind of poor replication, and we you know, the lag was always in many seconds. <laughs> and so we said seconds is a fine number to use as granularity. Nowadays for Postgres, it's not really applicable, but we haven't went back to fix this yet. So as soon as I do this backfill, what happens is that thing is essentially like a snake trying to eat a watermelon, right? It's gotta go through the whole system and it clogs it up. And what you start to see at that red arrow is that we're losing 30 seconds for every wall clock minute of replication delay. And after 19 minutes, we're 10 minutes behind on this replica. But you'll also notice another thing, that blue line starts to pick up about halfway through. And it's doing a lot of reads on the replica. Why is it doing that? Well, because it didn't have all the PG Bench history in RAM, so it actually had to start loading it off disk, which slows the replication down even more. And now we're losing almost 40 seconds for every wall clock minute, right? So this is how on a regular RDS Postgres instance, you can actually have a lot of replication problems if you do things like backfills or have any other issues. This is the same benchmark running on Aurora. So the big difference is we use milliseconds for our latency for our replication lag. And if I didn't have the red arrow there, would you be able to tell where I did the backfill? You wouldn't, right? Because the replication lag basically didn't change because I'm backfilling a table that it's gonna send those writes over and then it's gonna find that they're not in memory and not do anything with them. So there's no update that happens. The other really cool feature that we launched in the last year is called Fast Clones. So I'm illustrating sort of the same setup we've had before. I've just kind of changed the storage to look a little different where I have blocks instead of the storage nodes, just to illustrate some of the concepts here. So let's say your business wants to do a lot of reporting, but they want the data frozen at midnight. Well, you could do a point in time recovery, fire that up, that'd be great, but you have to you know, allocate all that storage. Let's say it's 20 terabytes. Instead, what you can do, you can have your reporting application create a clone. And so this is a really cool thing in that you get clone storage. What do I mean by clone storage? Well, clone storage doesn't actually exist. All it is is pointers to the primary storage to start with. So if you clone a 20 terabyte database, you're not paying for 20 terabytes of storage. You're paying for nothing until you modify it. So in actuality, what happens with when you start actually running your application here is when you do a read, it's gonna go find the address in the clone storage, but it's actually gonna go read from the primary storage, right? So you don't actually have to duplicate it. So that works, but what happens when I try to do a write? I don't wanna modify the primary storage, so we do copy on write at that point. So before the block is modified, it gets copied down to the clone storage, right? And we basically unlink the relationship between those two blocks. You can create new blocks, they're just gonna go in your clone storage, and there's no relationship to the primary storage there. When the original read-write master basically writes a log record, you'll see that it only updates the primary storage. It doesn't actually make changes to the clone storage because they're separated at the time you clone, right? It's not any kind of lagging uh, uh, updates or anything. And when the read-write node modifies a current block that's shared by both of them, basically we do that same copy on write in reverse and you know, give the new block to, or new block for the primary, the old block goes to the clone storage, right? So this is a fantastic tool for using for reporting, for testing, uh, for benchmarking. To illustrate this, I ran a PG Bench read write benchmark. And I set a target rate of 10 or 20,000 TPS, and it's a 10 
thousand row or ten, scale 10K, sorry, um, which results in about 150 gig. So one of the things that people ask me is, well, this clone stuff sounds great, but does it impact my performance? So I'm running along on purple, right? That's my primary that I started. And I requested a clone at about, uh, I think, uh, 20 minutes in, right? You'll notice there's no degradation in performance when I did that. And about 15 minutes later, my clone was finished being created. Um, I wasn't actually keeping absolute track of it. So about 18 minutes or 20 minutes later, I fired up the same, oops, sorry. I fired up the same benchmark on the blue. And you can see that we actually get the exact same performance on the clone, right? And we see no degradation in the performance of either of them. So this is a way where you can go get a copy of your production system and then go run tests on it, for example, and it's quite inexpensive. So as I mentioned earlier, two of the, the uh, features that we're still working on for parity are replication-related uh, ones, and I'm going to talk about them now. So the first one is logical replication support. So this, how many people are familiar with logical replication in Postgres? Some, not too many. So this is the ability for Postgres to take the physical changes that go into the wall stream, the write ahead log, and convert them back to SQL so that you can take them from your instance and use them to you know, a data warehouse or a lot of different things. So we support this on RDS Postgres today and we're working on it for Aurora. So if you have an Aurora instance, what you're gonna be able to do in the future is you're gonna necessarily, you could fire up an EC2 instance and you can enable logical decoding plugin. And we support three of them today. And you can choose which one you want to use. And the EC2 instance basically is going to talk to the Aurora instance and get those logical changes. And then it could ship it to something like Kinesis, for example, right? The other thing you can do with this is you can fire up our DMS service, our data migration service, which is really a replication service at heart. And you can have it talk to your instance and pull changes off. And you can send those to RDS, you can send them to S3, you can send them to Dynamo, you can send them to Redshift. So there's all kinds of places that you can move your data to, right? Now this is really nice, but as you can see, it involves having another box and some, some stuff happening, right? If you just want to replicate between Postgres instances, in V10, we're going to be able to support publish and subscribe. So this is if you have an EC2 instance running Postgres, an RDS instance, you can actually set up publish on one side and subscribe on the other. You don't have to have any secondary boxes, and you can move logical data between the two of them. And again, this is for, you can use an RDS instance for Postgres, or another Aurora instance will be able to work like this. So this is really handy if you want to move data around. So the other thing customers really talk to us a lot about is being able to have DR. And so the feature that uh, is going to support that is our cross-region replication. So here I'm showing region A with an Aurora uh, cluster. Um, what you want is region B to have a copy, right? So we're introducing some new, uh, new features. The first is that we're having a replication server and a replication agent. That's the little boxes in purple. And the goal of those is to support this cross-region replication. When you do a log write, which is all we do, right, um, on the primary, it's going to flow to a bunch of different places. So it goes to the read-only nodes, do that invalidation, as I talked about. It flows down to the storage level for the durability, and it goes to the replication server. The replication server is going to forward that on to the replica replication agent on the other side, and then it's going to apply it to the read-only node for, again, cache and validation purposes uh, or updates, and it's going to flow to Aurora storage, right? So this way, you can actually uh, physically get all the physical changes on both sides. It's going to be very low latency uh, and very efficient. Now, one of the things that can happen is you can sometimes lose log vectors, um, and the nice thing is that we actually can handle that. We can also handle having multiple read-only nodes. In the future, we're going to support multiple regions as well at the same time. So the replication server and agent talk to the storage servers as well, and they can actually pick log vectors or blocks from the one side and move them to the other, right? So we can actually do catch-up in multiple ways for repair purposes. So you can use this in a DR scenario where, you know, something's happened to a region, or you could move, use it to move one region to another. We had a lot of customers when new regions pop up, sometimes they're closer to their customers than our current regions, and this is a really nice way where you can just basically go and promote um, the new one to be the new writer. And at that point, you know, you have your same cluster, you can have all the same read-only nodes and everything else. So this can also be used for, you know, remote reads in other regions as well. So caching, we made a bunch of changes in uh, Aurora for caching. Um, we'll walk through that. So on an R416XL, very large box, 480 gig of RAM, right? So when we set up RDS Postgres, we basically allow about 25% of that RAM for Postgres processes in the OS. About another 25% goes to the shared buffers, 
for inside the database, and the rest goes to the Linux page cache. So this is actually where Postgres is different than most databases in that it uses two caches, right? Most just have something like shared buffers. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to that. So the first is when you're selecting data, the Postgres process is gonna go look for it in shared buffers, and if it doesn't find it there, it's gonna ask for storage. It might find it in the page cache. If it doesn't, it's gonna go to EBS and pick it up, and then it has to return all the way back up the stack. So this works well, but there's a little overhead. The other thing is, because you have two caches, you get duplicate buffers. So even though we have 75% of the space for caching, in actuality, we only end up caching about 50% of the blocks, right? So only about 240 gig of cache space is used there. On Aurora, it's quite different because we still need the space for Postgres and the OS, but we don't have a page cache because we don't have a, or a file system. We write directly to Aurora storage. So we're gonna use all of that remaining uh, RAM for shared buffers, so 75%. When we do a read from Postgres, again, the same thing, we're gonna look at shared buffers, but if it's not there, we're gonna directly get it from Aurora storage and return it. Excuse me. So Postgres can die, right, as a process, and that's fine because, you know, it's durable. But you want it to come back up and be fast, right? So you wanna have your buffers. But your buffers also go away when Postgres dies. But the Linux page cache doesn't, so guess what? You're happy because your blocks are in cache and your database is back up and it's all working fine, right? So we had the difficult decision of being like, well, we don't have a file system cache, so we're not gonna get that benefit. So we actually had to go build a feature called survivable cache. So this is where we go and do invalidation on the cache. When the Postgres process dies, we actually have the shared buffer separated from the Postgres process, and therefore they can survive. We just need to invalidate a little bit of metadata, and then, bam, it's all good, right? So this gives us the exact same sort of story around caching. But there are some advantages. So to show that, I ran a read-only benchmark, right? So this is just reads, scale 22,000. So that's 350 gig working set, right? But it should fit in RAM, because we have 488 gig, right? So in R416 Excel, in the blue I'm showing Aurora with a 75% cache. We're getting 600, almost 690,000 TPS. So this is really cool when you just think about it as a raw number. I mean, that's like a very fast system, right? So I went and ran that on RDS Postgres with its 25% uh, shared buffers. And I got 1.6 times slower. And I was like, what's going on here? I didn't expect that. Well, it turned out I was doing 18,000 read IOPS. And the reason was because this size of working set didn't fit because of the double counting of buffers, right, that we had the overhead of that. So to fix that, what a lot of people recommend in the Postgres universe is to make the cache smaller, right? Um, make the shared buffer smaller, give it all to Linux page cache. And so that's what I did. I went down to a 10% cache so it would all fit in cache. And I got a lower number. And I was like, man, I'm doing something wrong. So I went and said, well, what's going on here? Why am I being slower? Well, as it turns out, because the overhead of having to read both the shared buffers and check for it there and then go to the file system cache and then go back up through those layers burns CPU. This is a heavy CPU benchmark, right? And so I'm stealing CPU cycles to do that, which means I can't do more transactions. And so this is why I'm actually slower. And to demonstrate there's no goofy business with Postgres, if I make the cache 75%, the shared buffers, we get basically the exact same number as Aurora, because reading blocks from memory is essentially the same on both of them. But guess what? If you configure RDS Postgres like this, and the Postgres process dies, no survivable cache, right? So this is one of the, again, the cool differences that we've improved uh, on with Aurora. So this is all great when, you know, just the Postgres process dies. But what happens when I have to do a failover, right? What about my cache then? So to illustrate that, I'm running PG Bench with a 20x read-only to a 1x read-write benchmark on a node, right? It's 160 gig in cache, and vertical access is transactions per second, and I'm doing about, I think, what was it, like 350,000 total transactions between the reads and writes. And at 10 minutes in, I basically do a failover, right? And it takes 32 seconds to come back up, and that's including DNS, and I just had PG Bench in a little loop just trying to connect, right? So as soon as DNS propagated, it connected, and it was all good, right? But if you look at the 90th percentile of my performance, right, I should be much closer to about 320,000 if that's what my application needs, right? So it actually took 340 seconds to get back to having the cache all warmed up and to get back to that baseline performance, right? So when we talk about failover, we're actually not being very good when we say, oh yeah, it's failed over in 32 seconds. But you know, from an application user's perspective, 
it really didn't, right? It took a lot longer. So to get around this, we built a new feature called Cluster Cache Management, or CCM, as I like to call it. So again, we got the same standard setup, and I'm gonna introduce a new term, which is failover priority. So this is a feature that we've had in Aurora, um, and you can actually designate your nodes for which failover priority, with zero being the highest priority. I know that sounds kind of backwards, but uh, it's easier to figure out you know, which one to go to. So you notice that the read-write one and the one read-only node are, are failover priority zero. So this is gonna be where we go first. All these other read-only nodes I've, I've labeled failover priority one. Now that doesn't mean we won't fail over to them, it just means that we'll consider them less likely to happen because we're gonna try the other nodes first, right? So once you've done this, and if you turn on APG CCM enabled in your uh, uh, parameter group at the cluster level, essentially we're gonna start doing extra stuff. And the first thing is the read-only node is gonna send a bloom filter of what the replica's cache looks like back to the read-write node. The read-write node is gonna compare that with what it's got in cache, and then it's gonna send the addresses of the blocks that it wants to load on the read-only node. And then the read-only node in the background is basically going to slowly read those blocks in, I shouldn't say slowly, over a, a little bit of time, read them in, and you'll now notice the color on the read-only node is the same as the read-write node because the caches are basically very similar now. Now we don't do this for every block, every change, because you know, if you had a lot of cache churn, you only really want the stuff that's hot in the cache to be coming across, right? Because it is extra read workload on your read-only node. But there's a reason why you wanna do this. So I ran the exact same benchmark, same failover at 600 seconds, and the blue is with CCM enabled, and the red is the original, right? So we had the 340 seconds, so now we're back to 32 seconds for failover, but we're 32 seconds for failover and back to our 90th percentile performance, right? So now we truly have failover at 32 seconds, not 340, right? So this is a very important um, feature, and it's also gonna allow us over time to try to get that 32 seconds down further because there's less disruption to the customer when you do these failovers. So one of the other things that we've worked on is performance. Um, to illustrate performance, one of the other tools we built was Performance Insights. So this is available across a lot of our engines, but Aurora Postgres was the first one we had. Um, and this is a really nice tool for being able to see what's going on with performance in your database, right? So what I'm illustrating here is that my application was running along fine, and then at some point it kind of went off the rails, right? So the green is CPU usage, and that little black line across the top is my actual number of CPUs. So it basically means I have the box pinned to the wall, right? It's just flat out running. But I'm like, well, it wasn't doing that before. What's, what's changed? So I drill in and I look at the current run, what's going on right now, all this CPU usage, and I can see it's this query. And it's, hopefully you can see that. It's, it's basically a, an analytics query, right, that I'm running against PG Bench history. And, you know, that seems kind of horrible, but wait, let's go look at it before. Well, it was running before and it was running fine. So what happened, right? So, as it turns out, the plans have changed. So before, what I was doing was I was getting a nested loop, bitmap heat scan, a bitmap index scan, right? Afterwards, I'm now getting a hash join, and I'm getting sequential scans, right? So this is a dramatically worse plan. Well, why did that happen? Well, could be a stats change, could be analyzed, could be a config change, could be an index. I mean, it's probably not an index change in this case, right? But all these things can cause plans to change on you in dramatic fashions, right? As it turns out, the reason why this happened was me. I changed a couple parameters, right? Not that anyone's ever inadvertently set the wrong parameter in their database, right? So I did this deliberately just to show that, you know, the plans can dramatically change, and, you know, that's a bad thing, right? So if you come from enterprise databases, you know running fast is great, but running consistently is actually probably more important, right? Your manager, if, you're, if you're your database running 2% faster, he's gonna be happy. If on the other hand, your database uh, blows up because it goes 500% slower, right? Your manager's gonna be in your office yelling at you, right? So to get around this, we've got a new feature out in our new um, latest release of 10, 10.5. It's also gonna come on our nine version uh, in our next release called Query Plan Management or QPM. So what this allows you to do is capture statements, right? So as the statements are running in the database, you can actually capture them. So in this case, I'm showing query A, plan version one, query B in the sort of pink, plan V1, right? So you can then approve these plans. You can do this automatically or manually. And once you say they're good, they're marked as approved, then you can institute a baseline by 
instituting a baseline, you're telling the optimizer to basically use these plans, right? And to not deviate from that. So this allows for plan stability, right? So you're not gonna get weird plans. So when a new version of this plan shows up, it's not going to automatically be used by the optimizer, right? It's, it's gonna be discarded because it's not the approved plan. It's not in the baseline, right? But the challenge with this, if you do this, right, if someone comes along and says, I'm gonna build an index now to make that query better, right? And this plan, V3, might actually be better. But it won't use it, right, because I've got the baseline. Well, we allow you to evolve to better plans. And we do this by having a comparison utility that allows you to compare plans and figure out based on elapsed time and cost whether it's better. And if it is, then you can just approve that plan and it's gonna be used in place of the original plan, right? To illustrate like, what happens when you use baselines, let's go back to my uh, PI uh, screen and you'll see that this is when I instituted the baselines back on, right? My plans go back to exactly how they were before. Um, and my performance gets very predictable, right? So this, this shows you that you can actually have you know, control of your plans and a much more predictable database performance than you had before. One of the other things around predictable performance, you need vacuuming if you're running Postgres, right? So this is just a benchmark I ran a long time ago that shows what happens if you turn off vacuuming, right? The red line is where you'd like to be at, and the black line is sort of what happens over time. It just drifts down because you have more bloat in your system, right? So you need to vacuum to main, maintain performance. The other thing is you need to maintain uh, the cleanup of transaction IDs. Postgres has a limit, and if you run out of them, you basically are gonna be down until you vacuum. So this is a very important thing. So as part of the building of Aurora Postgres, it was great, you know, we got the benchmarks, we're writing three times faster, this is all great. And then we sat there and said, well, wait a minute, if we're writing three times faster and vacuum's running at the same speed, that's just gonna be a recipe for disaster, right? So we went and did vacuum improvements. So the one that we've done so far is called Intelligent Vacuum Prefetch. So in Postgres, when it's vacuuming, it has two things, a visibility and a frozen map. And these are great improvements that were done in, a while back in Postgres that allows Postgres not to have to scan the entire table to figure out what to vacuum. And in this case, I'm showing basically an illustration of the frozen map, where the blue are things, blocks that are frozen, or, uh, and the red ones are not, that they still need to be vacuumed, okay? So Postgres is gonna go and read the ones that it needs, and it's gonna go vacuum them, right? So you'd expect it to do basically what I've illustrated for the red uh, arrows, right? But because Postgres uses a file system cache, it's trying to get read ahead. So it actually has an instruction that says, if those red blocks are within 32 of each other, then just read them all, right? So this actually causes a lot more effort to, to have to happen, right? And so I'm not actually sure it, on modern SSDs if this still makes sense, but it's what Postgres does today. I think it's, you know, we may want to look at that in the future. But for us, we don't have a file system cache. We don't do read ahead in the sort of normal way. It's quite different. So on Postgres, this took 402 seconds when I did this vacuum. On Aurora, what we do is we collect the block addresses of the things that need to be vacuumed. We gather those all together, and then we submit one I.O., right? And it's got one, up to 256 blocks can get returned from this one I.O., right? And so this is much more efficient. The other thing with Aurora Postgres is, because we're not doing checkpoints or full page writes, vacuuming costs less to actually do. So the combination of those two things means that Aurora Postgres did the same vacuuming in 163 seconds, so more than twice as fast as regular Postgres. So this was a nice improvement that really uh, changed for a lot of our customers. They used to have problems with vacuums on Postgres, and they're not having any on Aurora now. So how many people are aware of Aurora Serverless? Cool. Well, I'm very happy to announce that we now have Aurora Postgres as serverless in preview. Yeah, it's very exciting, very exciting, yeah. Um, this is a really cool feature I think is gonna you know, dramatically change for a lot of people how they run their databases. Um, so what this is, is a little different model though. You have a database endpoint just like you always have an RDS, but you have this new thing called a request router in that sort of light purple box. And you'll notice that I have Aurora there but there's no server right now. And there's just the storage. So when you provision something, that's all you start with, right? You don't actually have a server running. It's not until your application goes to do work that you actually fire up a server, right? I mean, you can configure it to always be there, but you don't have to. So at that time, we're gonna pull an instance out of our warm pool, and we're gonna attach it to your storage. And then it's gonna start executing queries for you, right? 
And as you push harder, essentially we'll go through and we'll actually scale this up or scale it down. So, you know, if you just keep pushing harder, you're gonna get a bigger, bigger instance, right? And this happens quite quickly, right? So I'll show in a second, the, it takes about five minutes of, you know, increased CPU to cause that to trigger. But the cool thing is because you have this request router in the middle, you don't actually drop sessions, right? You don't lose connections when we do this. So this is all seamless from an application perspective. It just goes up and down, right? The other cool thing is you pay per second in one minute minimums when you spin up, right? So if you have an application that only runs for four hours a day, it'll just basically go to sleep and then the next time somebody connects to it, it'll fire back up. So from an economics perspective, this is very helpful for those kind of applications. And the other cool thing, of course, is Aurora storage can grow on its own, so you don't have to worry about that. And as I said, as soon as your application goes away, guess what? So can your box, right? To illustrate this, we ran a benchmark where we just sort of uh, were pushing harder. So the, um, the blue line is the number of serverless er, units that, of capacity, and the orange line was CPU. So I started the benchmark, I'm basically at zero, right? So I'm, I'm not doing anything. As soon as I connect and start pushing, we scale up, right? And then I continued to increase the benchmark, so it continued to ask for more and more CPU, and we just kept scaling up, right? Until we got to the largest size, that I'd, I'd capped it at 64 units. Um, and you can go all the way up to 256 units, i.e. the largest box we have, like an R416 XL. And then, basically, I ramped the same benchmark down, and it scaled back down. And then I stopped it, and guess what? My instance went away, right? So this is really useful um, as a tool for Lots of different ones, especially uh, for a lot of people who do IoT-based stuff, where it's completely unpredictable demand. Uh, this is a great, uh, great solution. So this is all great. People say, Aurora, I like it. How do I get to it? Well, so that's migration, right? So there's four primary methods to come in. Uh, if you're on Postgres, one of the things you can do is PG dump restore. I'm not going to talk about that in great detail, because most people are pretty familiar with those. Uh, data migration service I'll cover. Snapshot import was our initial implementation for moving from RDS Postgres, but I'm gonna only talk about the read replica model because I think it's a superior uh, method for moving in. So DMS is a really cool tool. I was so excited when we built this. Um, we had a lot of customers talk to us about moving from either one database, the same, you know, moving from Postgres to Postgres, but in a lot of cases, customers wanted to move from Oracle or SQL Server to Postgres, right? So any of these engines are supported on the left there. And all you do is you fire up a Postgres instance, an Aurora Postgres instance, and then you fire up a DMS instance. And you configure DMS and you tell it, go connect to this database, figure out what things to you know, pull from it. And once you do that, it will basically do a consistent select where it does a full load, right? Now, this is fine, but that takes quite a while to run, right? And so in the meantime, your application is still doing stuff. That's the magic of logical replication in DMS, is it uses the change data capture in all these engines to basically allow you to catch back up from when you started that copy, right? So then your database gets to the same state as on both sides. So once it's essentially caught up, you stop the application and you start it on the other side, right? And this is a great way to migrate in, especially if you're coming from a different engine. On the other hand, if you're in RDS, there's a much easier way. If you're an RDS Postgres, you have your application, your RDS Postgres instance, you basically ask us to do a migration, or I mean a read replica in Aurora. We, we take a snapshot. Then we have to do some conversion to make it into Aurora. So that's what happens there. And once that's done, you know, that takes a tiny bit of time, tiny bit of time, a little bit of time. But you, again, have done more transactions, right? So we actually make it a read replica. So it catches up via asynchronous wall replication, just like a normal Postgres instance. So at this point, it's just like you have a normal read replica. It just happens to be Aurora, right? So you can keep running it for a while. You can choose when to migrate. But once it's all caught up, you essentially need to just stop your application, let the last bit of wall flow through the system, right? And then you can stop the replication and promote the Aurora Postgres instance, right? So we've had people do this migration in a couple minutes from RDS Postgres. So this is really nice if you want to move from RDS Postgres to Aurora Postgres. Uh, yeah, and so that's how you can get into Aurora. Uh, as a note, uh, we have some more breakouts um, on these subjects. Uh, the first one, obviously, Tuesday, uh, that one's already gone by. Uh, tomorrow, we have a talk uh, by some of my colleagues on uh, RDS Postgres and sort of Postgres in the AWS universe. It's going to talk more about identity and access management and some of the other uh, features we've done across both engines. And then um, 
my colleague David, who's sitting here in the front, he's going to be with uh, another one of my colleagues, Jim, doing a deep dive on performance on Thursday uh, in ARIA. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll happy to take some questions off to the side. Oh, and the other thing is, if you have any other general RDS questions, uh, we have people down at the booth uh, all, all conference long, so we have lots of engineers there, so if you have other questions, you can come down there and talk to us there.